Good morning, and welcome to the Chesapeake Food Shed Network Coffee Talk Series, Learning and Connecting for Action. My name is Christy Gabbard, and I'm the owner of Local Concepts, a consulting firm which provides the development and coordination support for the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. I'm joining you today from Southwest Virginia, where we've got snow on the ground and the kids are home from school. And I'm also joined by my Local Concepts team, Jonas Sipos and Hannah Gross, who are uh, joining us from Maryland. And of course, Kate Clancy is with us also from Maryland. Before jumping into the coffee talk, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. The Chesapeake Food Shed Network is a group of organizations, businesses, funders, agencies, and other change agents working across the Chesapeake watershed to build a stronger and more resilient food system. We are a relatively new initiative, about a year and a half in the making, and uh, the leadership group that spurred the network's development did so because they recognized that there was, and there still is, a great deal of extraordinary work being done to advance our food system, but that there was no ent entity intentionally trying to build connections, trust, and relationships among those out there doing the work. Our mission is to catalyze connections and collaborations, and we believe by doing so, we can help to accelerate change in our food system. This is a picture of our network building blocks, and as you can see, the foundation of our network is all about building connections, about getting to know one another, building relationships and trust, and with that, um, we think that as you know one another better, um, and you are more aware of other programs going on that may be similar to yours and that you can learn from them, that we can um, over time see opportunities to align and to work collectively towards action. We invite anyone that supports our vision of a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system to participate in the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. The Coffee Talks are a platform that we developed to help catalyze connections around specific food system topics. The idea is to partner with a resource expert to provide a quick learning opportunity through the webinar, and then during the webinar and in the follow and in the follow-up materials, identify ways for people to continue to engage and to dig in deeper around that food system topic. So it's taking these learning opportunities, and instead of them being one-off, we try to provide ways for people to continue to learn more and get connected with others doing similar work. Related to the topic of today's Coffee Talk, Why Regional? The Chesapeake Food Shed, the Chesapeake Food Shed Network, is in the initial phase of engaging stakeholders to develop and implement a food system vision for the Chesapeake region. Uh, because agriculture is the biggest source of pollution in the Chesapeake Bay, and because there's already a concerted effort to tackle uh, the water quality problems in the Bay, we have used the Chesapeake Bay watershed to define our food shed. And so you can see here a picture of our map, which, which um, illustrates the watershed. It is comprised of portions of six states and Washington, D.C. We think a regional approach, as opposed to a local one, will not only better enable us to tackle the agricultural pollution uh, in the Bay, uh, the water quality pollution in the Bay from agriculture, but it will better enable us to tackle other um, pressing problems such as hunger, food waste, and, economic vi and the economic vitality of food-based jobs. This webinar actually kicks off what will be a series of learning and engagement opportunities for developing a food system vision for the Chesapeake region. If you want to be involved with this process, we invite you to visit our website and click on Get Involved so we know how to contact you. There are also a couple handouts that you can find in the GoToWebinar control panel that will further describe the Chesapeake Food Shed Network and our efforts in developing a regional, a regional food system vision. So given all of that, uh, you know, if we are going to move towards a regional vision, understanding why a regional approach is so important, and this is why I'm so excited to have Kate here 
today um, to talk with us about why a regional approach is important and how to incorporate that regional perspective into your work. Uh, before we get started, we did want to pull the audience to get a sense from you all um, who out there is already working on a regional scale or who might be headed in that direction. So uh, I'm going to throw up this poll and ask you all to take just a few seconds to, to answer this question. Okay. So 57% of you are working on a regional scale, 20% are not, and 24% are um, planned to, um, are not at this time, but are planning to. Thank you for sharing that information with us. So what so what we would like to do and ask you to do is if you look at your GoToWebinar control panel, we'd really like to learn more about the work that you're doing at a regional scale. And we invite you to use the question box on your control panel to share with us any of the projects you are working on at a regional scale. We'd like to know who you are, what you're working on. Um, and we will also, if you have any questions during the presentation, we invite you to Put those in the, uh, pose your questions using the question feature in the GoToWebinar control panel. Yona will be collecting your questions. She will also be collecting your project descriptions. Um, and we will share those with Kate and after the end of her presentation. Uh, see if there's any other housekeeping items for you before we get started. Uh, we will be recording the webinar, and we will share the recording as well as the slides with you um, as a in a follow-up email. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Kate to you. Kate Clancy is currently a food systems consultant, visiting scholar at the Center for a Livable Future, Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. She's an adjunct professor at Tufts University and senior fellow in the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture, University of Minnesota. She resides in University Park, Maryland. Kate did her doctorate in nutrition at the University of California, Berkeley. Her resume includes positions at Cornell and Syracuse University and sabbatical appointments at the University of, Universities of Wisconsin and Minnesota. She worked as a nutrition and policy advisor at the Federal Trade Commission and at several nonprofits such as Wallace Center. Clancy has developed a graduate course on food systems in 1982 and since then has published, taught, spoken, and consulted widely on sustainable agriculture, food systems, and food policy with government agencies, universities, and nonprofits around the country. Uh, Kate is the de deputy director of the USDA funded five year enhancing food security in the Northeast systems project, and uh, she has engaged with many initiatives, including Agriculture of the Middle and It Takes a Region. Kate is a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee that a year ago published a framework, for, a framework to assess the health, environmental, social, and economic effects of the U.S. food system. So with that, I'm very pleased to, um, to have Kate share her presentation with you. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Christy. Am I coming through okay? You sound great. All right. Um, and thanks all of you who were on the webinar. What I've done for this morning is pull together material from a, a number of places. Some, especially those of you in the Northeast, will have seen some of these before, but there's also some more recent material. And as Christy, I think, made clear, uh, I have a great interest in knowing about your experiences with regional networks to this point, and uh, I appreciate their being willing to um, pull that information together for us. So this is um, why regional, incorporating a regional perspective into your work. Obviously, some number of you are already doing that, but maybe a review is, is not a bad thing. Uh, this is <clears throat> from Clancy and Roof, the Choices article and the much larger paper 
that is on the, still on the NISOG website called It Takes a Region. Um, I'm not going to read through most of these. Um, local is a part of regional, um, but regional is more than just a lot of different con uh, conglomeration of, of local activities and projects and, and geography. Regions evolve, and that's really important. We'll keep talking about that over the course of my presentation today. And um, they, of course, regions themselves are nested within across state and with across state boundaries. For example, we have the entire Northeast region, and then we have uh, today uh, a very good example of a nested region, and that's the Chesapeake Bay food shed region. Um, although there is a difference, uh, Virginia is not in the Northeast region, and Virginia is a important part of the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, Inter, intra and interregional transactions take place um, in regions, <clears throat> and here is a definition that uh, Kathy and I came up with some years ago now about of what an ideal regional food system is, um, and basically it's one in which as much food is produced and processed and, and distributed. Um, within the region at multiple levels and scales, resulting in maximum resilience, and we'll talk about that later, uh, minimum importation, or as, as, a little importa as little importation as is reasonable, and significant uh, returns to the stakeholders in the region. It is important, and we'll, you'll see later, regions are very different, and the Northeast region is quite special in terms of lots of things, of course, we're very biased about that and not to uh, offend anybody else in another region across the country. Uh, <clears throat> here's another um, list of some of the elements of regions that the boundaries, again, are fluid and nested. Um, the boundaries of, the ch of all regions are, get defined by how people think about them in, in one um, example. They are defined by lots of different features that define all kinds of geographic areas in which there is human and political activity. Food systems are geographically fixed to regions. Uh, that if you think about, um, they are place-based, and that's because of, weather, of geography. You, do, you define regions by their geographic boundaries. And we have, there are here some other examples of regions, uh, the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast Kingdom, uh, Cape Cod, etc. You will see that we are particularly um, interested here in, uh, in, in, in our work uh, and certainly in EFSNI's work in regions that cross state boundaries. And there are a number of reasons for that, and those will come out as I go ahead. There are four key, key parameters that we've identified from which to start to make the argument for paying a lot more attention to regions. <clears throat> one is that, <clears throat> uh, one to start with, food sheds are defined as the geographic area from which a population derives its food supply. For most countries, and it's very much for the United States at this point, that means um, globe, the, our food shed covers the globe. We are getting food from everywhere, from the the smallest backyard to the to the longest distance uh, country that's uh, either shipping or or air air freighting food into the U.S. But we, as you know, we're all interested in how to make the food shed more dependent on uh, closer in areas, including regions. So the questions that have to be asked about demand is what how how big is the population in a region? Uh, what percentage of the diet can, in fact, be produced, or the foods in a diet can be produced in the region? We uh, go back all the time to the original work by Chris Peters and Jennifer Wilkins and Gary Fick that pointed out that given the population density of the state of New York, at this point it could produce 20% of its total demand for the uh, for food. Uh, that's not count. That was not counting urban agriculture. That will add some, but it's not going to make a huge difference in the that number. Um, and then in a, a later study, they found out that most New York population centers could source their food and nutrition needs if you left out New York City altogether. Uh, 
when you're in New York saying this, then people laugh. Uh, you might be chuckling yourselves. We don't intend to leave out New York City in terms of its food demands. So that has to meet the food supply, and again, you see this. Uh, the Greater Philadelphia Food System, thinking about 100 miles as, a, as their parameters, came up 40% of the acres needed short, um, which is a lot of acres. And um, so th these are the kinds of things that you have to put together in terms of starting your work about how much food can a region um, produce as well as the rest of the supply chain, produce process, et cetera, uh, given the total population. We believe that it would be useful to do a lot more research about this in other regions throughout the country, and there have been a few other studies, one out of Iowa State in particular, but this is a really useful thing to do. One of the things to do is to think about if, if trying to increase the supply is to expand the geographic area that you're, that you're thinking about. And this brings us to um, the another element, which is farm scale. And we, um, I'm kind of doing a truncated uh, uh, presentation right now on some of these issues because you could teach a whole course on it, which, which we have done. Um, going to the idea of, of agricultural of the middle, farms of the middle, those that are too big for direct marketing, too small for competing in big global commodity markets, Mid-sized farms needed to supply institutions with significant volumes of food. You all know we found this out a long time ago when Farm to School started. And so one of the things that's interesting is to match a crop mix with geography and farm size, which is what um, the uh, folks in the Midwest, this is a really nice graph from 2007. Um, that folks in the Midwest put together to identify their major growing and processing regions throughout the upper Midwest um, and, and a little bit farther south to, again, to give them themselves some parameters of where things were already being produced now. You can assume that some of this means that these are the areas where things are being produced now more or less coincide with soil types, with microclimates, uh, with other things. Go look at that uh, heavy, heavy circle of fruit up by the lake where it's a little warmer um, because of uh, the temperatures on lakes, although that could be changing. Anyway, um, the looking, I'm sorry, I'm going back to this, looking at this leads us to another key element, which is land use. Uh, uh, we've been saying this for a long time, those of us looking at regional and particularly in the Northeast, um, I, I still feel that land use is still too frequently ignored in research and planning of people doing food systems, to not taken into account quite enough probably by most food policy councils, et cetera. There are some concerns here. Uh, local decision making makes planning vulnerable. Most land use decisions are at the local level. Uh, we have it from lots of real life experience that a lot of people at a local level are not capable of seeing uh, the scale around them and they don't necessarily make the best decisions, particularly when it is a question of development versus uh, maintaining farmland. So maybe there's an issue about moving to larger scale political units. Some of those scales might be at a regional level. And there are environmental reasons for larger scale needs for land use decisions, for example, wildlife corridors. So that we pair that with the issue of resource sustainability. Uh, again, uh, getting land control that favors development, undermines an area's food security. Um, we also know that in many cases, not always, but in many cases, local food transport uses more energy than a larger system. So there are reasons for thinking about a larger scale here. Uh, many resource management initiatives are regional. Uh, for example, the Chesapeake Bay Commission, which has been a going concern for a number of decades right now, so has things like the Great Lakes Commission, et cetera. So we have some precedents for doing this work. Oops, did the wrong. Um, and then the last element that becomes a part of, of land use and resource sustainability is, is to ask questions about economies of scale. Some people argue that 
you know, food should be produced um, only at very small scale levels, and it's um, there's a good reason for thinking about that and doing that when it's reasonable. There's also even here's a quote from Bill McKibben: "What economies of scale will support?" An acceptable standard of living and be sustainable are the economies of scale that we need to be thinking about. And some of those are going to be larger scales um, because they'll have to and because of land use and resource use, etc. Um, I always say that economies of scale is not a four letter word, um, always. Economies of scope are one way to approach this. That is to think about, and we'll talk about this in just a second, to think about um, many different crops on many different mid-sized farms and many different uh, processors in an area at, at appropriate scales. And that leads us to um, the last component, uh, last key component, the key parameters that we identify as basic to thinking about a larger scale of um, food production processing, culture, etc. And that is um, economic development is uh, critical. We uh, embrace it all the time in terms of entrepreneurship, new businesses entering the food system, developing new niches, new markets. We need multiple market options. We need a lot of new business models. We need a lot of innovation for branding and infrastructure. I think we all know this. Um, with regard to that, uh, a lot of really excellent research, especially that's come out of England over the last no many, many decades now, rec helps us recognize there are different types of alternative chains, of food supply chains. Um, some of them are face-to-face, -face, but some of them are spatial proximity where you don't know the farmer, but you have information about that farm. Or they're even spatially extended where you don't know the farmer at all, and it may be a long ways away, but the product that's coming out of that place, some some place farther away, is a really good, sustainable, fair trade, whatever product. So we can differentiate products by place and attributes, and we want, and then we go to um, infrastructure um, it, it, that has to meet multiple um, requirements, including energy efficiency, um, and um, Geographic efficiency, we would add to that. Uh, would call your attention to wonderful work going on on transportation out of the Center for Integrated Ag Systems. And then finally, diversity being so important everywhere, in types of farms, in climates. Um, larger regions are likely to have more crop diversity, especially if they cross many latitudes like the Northeast region does. And I'll get back to this again. Diversity supports flexibility and resiliency, especially in the face of climate change. Here are uh, some uh, opportunities from a webinar that Kathy Roof gave uh, just about a year ago. Um, uh, opportunities for working regionally. Uh, you, I won't leave this up for very long, but you want you should go back to this list and and check your own work. Those of, that, of you that are working regionally or thinking about it, your own work about are you um, thinking about each of these. Um, elements in terms of what your uh, what your workload might be on the topic of regional food systems, gation coordinated services, targeted problem solving, which is what Christie is certainly doing with the CFN. Um, there are um, of course challenges. It ain't a piece of cake to do this kind of work. And here's a very good beginning list. And again, this is something that all of you might think about in terms of the challenges you're facing and where you're seeing where your particular issues are arising. There's um, parochialism, there's a lot of people's wish to not be engaged in things that get too complicated. Um, a lot of policy and political disincentives starting with county lines and city lines and state lines and, and all of that. Uh, Priorities and mandates that um, make it very difficult in some cases to, to uh, change a regulation or to change how people can work together. And of course, distance and logistics. But I, just, I think we need to just see these as challenges and, uh, and where we need to get to work to do better. 
And here are some examples um, the new, from the New England Food Policy Report, Building a Sustainable Food System, of uh, regional food system coordination in, um, in the Northeast. Uh, and then I want to uh, raise up a, a new paper that Kathy has written. It's in the Journal of Environmental Studies and Sciences uh, on resilience. And just to, you know, point out that um, <clears throat> there are um, a variety of ways here for people to work together. But the reason that we want to talk about resilience even more is that resilience is one of the key properties of, um, no, let me put it another way, scale is one of the key properties of resilience. And these are, Kathy's list is very practical. These are the reasons to look at resilience, um, re look at region through a resilience lens. But we also want to remember that a system is only as resilient as the strength of the ties between the scales that are inside of that system. Uh, I use another um, kind of aphorism from uh, some other work on resilience um, where it was pointed out by the authors that scales are absolutely critical and they are only they only work and they only provide resilience when the scales are talking to each other. So that means all of our projects, there should at least be local scale work talking all the time to the regional scale work. And here is another interesting new piece on um, uh, resilience, also from the same journal. And this is a paper by Laura Lenick and Michelle Miller and Jerry Martin. Some of you know Laura and Michelle. And uh, this is a paper that's really all about um, regional. Uh, uh, regionally scaled food systems and making a suggestion of restructuring the U.S. food system to be a nationally integrated network of sustainable metropolitan food sheds. And those metropolitan food sheds, many of them would, would be regions. And they say that it offers the potential to enhance the climate resilience of the U.S. food supply. This idea that they talk about this, um, these integrated food sheds, networks of food sheds, comes out of work that was done at MIT in 2011. I'm not sure it's gone much farther from 2011, but it is a very interesting idea. So, it, uh, so I'm just trying to give you a couple of new ideas of how to think about region. And now I want to move to, um, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, uh, the Regional Food Security Project that, um, <clears throat> as Christy mentioned, I've been the, I'm the deputy director of Stefan Getz at Penn State is the director. There are some people on the call who are part of the project, I noticed. Um, this is a regional food security project called ESNI which is about to finish its fifth year, and we will have another year to do all of our writing and analysis in. The region we use is the USDA Rural Development Unit of the 12 Northeast Straits and, and the District of Columbia. We have nine study locations. These are all low-income areas. They are uh, five urban and four rural. Uh, we have um, multiple, we have one or two low-income communities in each site. We are working uh, through 11 different institutions, uh, private, public in universities, as well as several nonprofits and two USDA agencies. We have 16 different disciplines represented in the project. Here is um, the, the schematic um, of uh, the, the study design. Uh, one of the nine locations, we'll assume that's Baltimore. Within Baltimore, we have two different neighborhoods. Uh, so we call them sites. Uh, we have done focus groups in, the, in both sites. In each site we have a store, uh, a store in that low-income area where we are focused is on the consumers patronizing the insto those stores as well as the store owners and a total diet market basket that's made up of eight foods. And so 
we are working to know a lot about the consumers, to know a lot about the supply chains of the market baskets in those stores. And uh, then finally, the base of our work is the agric agricultural production capacity of the 300 counties in the Northeast United States. This is a, a meta image of the project and if you read around the outside, our goal is, uh, operational goal is to answer the question, can greater reliance on regionally produced foods improve access for low income communities while also benefiting farmers, food, su food supply chain firms and others in the food system. The mustard colored um, spokes are uh, uh, the most key elements that we think of in the project, starting with regional self-reliance and, excuse me, my phone is ringing and I can't answer it. Um, starting with regional self-reliance, going to perceived barriers, the stores, a systems approach, access affordability, the scale of supply and demand, climate change, and very importantly, the community. And in the middle is the market basket. So all those things you can't read are that we have eight teams in the project and we have about 80 pieces now going in the project among the eight, among the eight teams. Um, so what, we, what I want to finish up with here is, the, is just a few findings that we have identified so far that directly relate to the, our region or to a, a regional analysis. Um, uh, Alessandra Bonanno and uh, Becky Cleary have done a lot of work using secondary data to um, think about the question of, um, <coughs> excuse me, where um, are stores located uh, in the uh, in the Northeast, and what are the key variables related to the location of those stores. So what we know from their analysis is the Northeast has a greater store availability than the rest of the U.S. That is, um, except for warehouse clubs and super centers. Overall, that's the whole, all, that's all the states. The county level store availability in the Northeast varies across poverty level and rural urban status. I think we probably already knew that. And then demand side factors influence the profitability of large food stores more than supply side ones and that you know and that we kind of knew already too from other research and how and what we know about what decisions stores make to locate in either low income or higher income areas the stores in our in our project are all independents not surprisingly to those of you who maybe do this kind of research um, the large chains in uh, national chains are not interested in working with people doing this kind of research. They don't want to share any any of their data. But we have had fabulous independent retailers. All of them are, are defined as supermarkets. We're not doing any small. Uh, we're not doing any small stores, uh, corner stores, etc. A lot of people already working on that. The other, the next thing out of um, the, so that's out of the consumption group, out of the distribution group. We have studied in, um, uh, we have done case studies based on interviews with our store owners, and these case studies include supply chain analyses of two of our market basket products, and those market basket products are actually listed here, with a percent that we now know from five stores the percent of those products that are regionally produced and um, and also the percent that's regional value added and that's really important because even if they may not be produced there's still a lot of value that's being added through uh, distribution and retailing and we can calculate them the margins and the amount and the, the costs of doing that kind of uh, distribution and retailing so kind of not surprising um, the, um, it's the fresh produce and milk, which is all, and milk is all regionally produced. Milk is usually a regional food, uh, mo uh, many places in the country. But the uh, frozen broccoli and the ground beef are not. And um, the, uh, the, well, I shouldn't say anything about the ground beef because that's, uh, we don't know about that. 
but the rest of it, there's a pretty good spread about what which of those foods are regionally produced and which foods we want to keep being regionally produced. Finally, we have studied in some depth the production capacity of the Northeast region. These data are the baseline data, uh, and this is a color-coded diagram of the views of all pasture and cropland um, the, uh, across the Northeast. And um, you, uh, some people have never seen a chart like this for their own region. Most regions probably look like this, although one might have not thought that, um, that you know there's a huge amount of other land in farms that is not in production. Um, it might be producing trees, or it might just be fallow, whatever. But you can see that a very large percentage of all the land use, even in the Northeast, is for animal production. And then that uh, that top right-hand corner shows you where uh, the production of all the other foods uh, in uh, that are not uh, that are not animal foods. And here's another way of looking at it: the regional self-reliance for grains as of 2010 is uh, about 8 percent, but for vegetables it's 26 percent. And breaking this down even farther. Um, the dark green leafy vegetables are 11%. Uh, the starchy vegetables, uh, that's corn, that's sweet corn and potatoes, and we grow a lot of potatoes in the Northeast, uh, is the highest in terms of its RSR. Uh, the red and orange vegetables are there some, and then uh, a great deal of many, many other vegetables that are <coughs> produced in the Northeast, at, uh, at up to a third percent of our demand. Another, um, we are also looking at climate change impacts. And this is a model simulated reduction in yield loss due to mid-century climate change production predictions and for both potatoes and corn. Now, these, uh, what you see, the map on the right is what we have now, and the map on the left is the predicted of what would happen due to climate change uh, up, uh, as of 2050. But what's also very important is that the other model, another model says that adaptation, that which could be all kinds of things, to different kinds of irrigation, to um, different breeds of um, potato or corn, can reduce the impacts or by half or greater. And of course, the reason you do this research is to get farmers and everybody else, state departments of agriculture and everybody else thinking about the need to, to start this adaptation now. Uh, and then the last thing we've done is we're, uh, we're looking at urban agriculture, uh, Michael Conard and his colleagues at Columbia University. And what this is, is uh, maps, of, this is, happens to be Baltimore. We have they have mapped five our five urban areas, uh, the location and and the, what they have mapped, and then imposed the maps on each other, are the location of production farms basically, although that might be hothouses other things, processing uh, industries, wholesale centers, retail and then warehousing. And the you can see in the bottom on the right the color coding for the urban, urban zones, three different types of peri-urban zones as you move farther out. There are multiple definitions of peri-urban, so they've chosen to have to, to um, disaggregate at least three of them. And then the green zones are, are formally rural and agricultural areas. And um, to finish up here, this is a very interesting finding for a lot of people who really haven't looked at this before, that you can see that, you know, the under production, uh, rural agricultural production, 57 percent is in, is in uh, agricultural production, 57 percent at least for the Northeast is in totally rural areas, but 38 percent 
is in peri-urban areas. And we know, we know that this is the case from a lot of research that American Farmland Trust has been doing for a long time. But this is a very, uh, very interesting to a lot of people who are, are seeing this for the first time. And, and also recognizing how much processing is going on in, in those peri-urban areas, wholesale, retail, uh, and, and, uh, and very much storage. So it, 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 is the, it, it is these kinds of data that are so useful for planning purposes, for figuring out where to focus in a supply chain or which pieces of the supply chain to pay attention to. Um, and we're hoping that as we finish up, over the next year and come out with many, 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 many more outcomes and outputs and materials for use by nonprofit groups and by, uh, by academics, but also materials to be used in our low-income communities, that this will be a very, um, that these, these data will be really useful to many of you and many more as we, um, you know, try to move along towards a stronger regional food system. So, Christy, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. Such uh, really in-depth information. And um, I know that Yona has been collecting the uh, questions as well as the uh, description of regional efforts. If you have not had a chance already to, to ask your question, please feel free to do so in the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel as well as share with, share with us what you are doing at a regional level. Um, we will, uh, again, share the presentation slides, uh, as well as a recording, a link to the recording of this webinar with the registrants after, uh, in the next day or so. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Yona, who has, as I said, been selecting your questions and will share them and some examples of the regional projects with you all and with Kate. So again, Kate, thank you very, very much. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, and like Christy said, I've been compiling questions and I'll intersperse them with some of the um, regional stories that people have been sharing. And there's some questions came in <clears throat> before Kate had touched on them in the presentation, but I'm still going to ask uh, questions in case there's more detail, Kate, that you're able to give or, or maybe resources that you're able to, to mention. Um, so the first question is from EJP Moli, and the question was, is creating a resilient and sustainable infrastructure part of your focus? Yes, the question is absolutely. Um, it's why we're, I, I didn't have a time to share much of the research that we're doing, and it includes work on the um, location of uh, distribution centers. It includes, obviously, a whole lot of work on um, the situation with regard to independent retail stores in the Northeast um, and the the whole project is, uh, at this point, we're ready to start writing some of the systems papers that will come out of the project. One of them is going to go, go is going to be about how to think about the role of the Northeast region, its role in basically not just the regional food system supply chain, but, uh, but the, the national, national food system. We're also going to be writing a paper that's pulling together all the information we have from our own research and, and um, secondary data about the situation with regard to these uh, independent grocers, many of whom function in low-income areas, and are, um, we're losing them. We lost, uh, we lost four stores just over the five years of our project. Um. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to keep moving through the questions. There was uh, the next one was from Stacy Diaz, and she asked, um, considering wide use of products like vanilla, pepper, coffee, and chocolate, where do these fit into American regional food systems? Well, those, uh, you know, I mean, everybody has their own response to that. My response is they they definitely fit in. Um, 
that we're not going to, we've never suggested, remember we're talking about regional self-reliance. Some people confuse that with self-sufficiency. We're not talking about self-sufficiency at all. That's, that, is, that doesn't make any sense um, given that not all, every place doesn't actually have all the best climate and the best soils and all kinds of other things. So those, those all fit in. Um, and I think that what we talk about with regard to those products is that the ideal situation is some form of fair trade for those products. That, I mean, mm -hmm. that's my particular answer. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. Nicholas Bender asked, could you talk more about how land use isn't used enough in research and planning? When we, when I and some of the rest of us look at the, the, the research projects that many, many people are choosing to do as well as the advocacy and policy work that um, many, many food policy councils do. Uh, I don't find anywhere near as often as I would like to an attention to land use in those um, efforts. I think maybe people think that there are some important, there are probably some important groups in every area working on land use policy, but I know for sure and from research we did, this was close to 10 years ago now, that most of those groups were not, even if they were in the same city or the same county, the land use folks and the tr land trust folks had no discussions of food uh, in their on their agendas, and there wasn't any networking across um, many of those uh, in many of those sites to bring the issues together in a way that they could be really understood. And I think very much to get more people working on lots of different kinds of food systems work to realize that land use is a really important part of that, and there's lots of different ways to incorporate it into their into their um, activities. And of course, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are many exceptions to this, but I've just seen a lot of this around the country in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, the next question is from Haley Barron, and uh, who asked, how do you calculate regional value added percentages, um, which you mentioned when discussing ma market basket items? Yes, and I, I will not take the time to answer that question on the webinar, but uh, I would be happy to have you email me and I will put you in touch with the folks at Cornell who are doing this all the time. And we, can, uh, we, have, we have materials that they, I'm sh they, I think they'd be really happy to share with you how you do that calculation. And you, you get it from a lot, you get it, you get the data from uh, interviews with the store owners and, uh, and other members of the supply chain. Okay, great. Well, and we'll follow up um, to make that connection after the webinar. Right. <clears throat> um, maybe we'll ask one more question for right now, and then we'll switch gears into um, sh highlighting some of the stories that have been shared about the regional work being undertaken. So this question is from Gerald McIntosh, who asked, do you think this data will predict a surge in urban or more peri-urban production in the next five years, or year to five years? Do I think our data will um, will lead to more activity? Um, it, it, I hope so. <laughs> I, we have to get it. We have to get our analyses to the right people. We have to get people in places like the Chesapeake Food Shed Network to recognize um, the compl you know the depth to which. Uh, some of their thinking needs to go so that they are in fact addressing the problems that they really want to address. Uh, I don't think it will happen in the next year. I would like to think that in some places in the Northeast um, these data will be helpful to people in some places uh, and not just the data on you know all, all kinds of our data on production and the stores and, and, and other things. I also 
I was talking to a friend uh, yesterday about this and uh, feel that my, my guess is that it will probably to, to move more in this direction will probably take like other things do a few more crises a few more um, problems with with drought in other parts of the country uh, uh, some more land loss unfortunately farmland loss and then just a lot of pushing and advocacy on behalf of these uh, of these food system issues mm -hmm. Thank you Kate um, is now a good time then for me to share some of the regional stories that um, that people have been sharing on on the on the platform? That'd be great. I th Thank that'd you. be great. Okay, great. So um, I'll just read out a few of them, and then we'll alternate in the last few minutes between these and a couple more questions, hopefully. So Megan Ames shared <clears throat> that she works for the Maryland Department of Health and Human Services. Because we serve the entire state of Maryland, we are always trying to achieve synergy on a regional level. One example of how we are doing this is by partnering with the Maryland Farmers Market Association to grow the farmers market network around the state. Um, Ginny Knight wrote that, uh, I'm Ginny Knight, currently at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, working on building coalitions and statewide actions through food councils across North Carolina. Uh, Jim Shulman from the Alliance for Regional Cooperation, uh, which is a group, it looks like, that is in formation. Uh, they're working on developing a multi-sector, not just food, producers and buyers club to serve the Mid-Atlantic, including Baltimore, D.C., and the Richmond metro regions. Um, I think this one was from Christy, who shared, Christy Gabbard, who shared that West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition um, are working within Ohio and West Virginia, working to connect food hubs along a regional food corridor. And Nicholas Bender shared um, that he's working with the Pittsburgh Western Pennsylvania region on identifying food access issues that seniors are facing. So there's quite a range of both regions and issues that are highlighted there which is really exciting to see. So please keep those stories rolling in. There are more that have already been shared, and like we mentioned, we'll, we'll, can, we'll share all of those, compile those and share them with Kate after the webinar as well. Um, and so I think we have a few more questions, a few, time for a few more questions. Um, so Kate, I'll, I'll pose these back to you. Stacy Diaz asked, where can we learn more about climate smart agriculture or climate change adaptation mechanisms? that are being used or promoted in the US? <laughs> That's interesting. That's a very interesting question, Stacey. Thank you. Um, I, I'll have to dig into where they're being promoted. There's some very good research going on, um, and I think ours is, is going to be really useful as well. But how, basically what I think your question is, have, have, has research been translated into into educational materials and activities and advocacy, I don't know about a lot of that work. I do know that a long time ago, Portland was the first place that if that I know that a food policy council of some kind, I believe it was through Multnomah County, um, developed a climate change plan um, as part of their policy council work. I'm sure there are some others like that. But that's that's a very good question, and um, that will make me want to go dig a little bit more. And if any of you know of such plans that engage, that in fact have it um, included climate change in um, in their activities, please let Christy know or or let me know. That would be uh, very useful information. Yes, please do send that on. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this name correctly. Wada Stock Stoker asked, what role do you see for farmers markets in meeting the needs for regional areas? Well, I, you know, I, that's, a very, that's a very interesting question. Um, in, in a number of areas, farmers markets are, are chartered uh, to say that they only um, uh, bring in food from what is defined as whatever that local area is. 
I know that in uh, on borders of states, there are farmers markets that cross borders, and that has always made a lot of sense to me. I think that um, that as people, you know, I think maybe the conversation would be interesting and useful among farmers markets at the, some of the national meetings, etc., to talk about. Um, what might be the benefits or the challenges or you know or any kind of problems of about um, having farmers markets have food in them that comes from not not just not just longer distances it's really not as much about the distance it's about breaking down the political barriers between counties let's say or or groups of counties, or across state lines, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question next from Benjamin Fischler, who asked, can you share any examples of the exceptions to land use or land trust groups not working with food system researchers and or food councils? Um, yeah, I can. I can I can think of I probably am going to go in the reverse I'm probably going to I know that for example the folks at ASAP in um, North Carolina in the Asheville North Carolina area definitely have included land trust um, land trust folks that have been inv involved in that work for quite a long time obviously um, places where uh, people are working with with people who work for or are affiliated with the American Farmland Trust in various places um, that is happening. Um, and after that, I my my information is too old. And um, so I won't I won't make up anything here <laughs> in terms of answering your question. But again, an, another very good question. If anybody's in a position to be able to, um, you know, uh, describe some of that to record when you're hearing about that. That again would be very useful. I, I feel that it would be just very useful for any of you interested, especially any of you who are outside of the Chesapeake Bay region, for us to continue to find some way to be in touch and keep track of what's going on around as the regional um, interest in regional grows. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just looking at the time. I think there might just be time for um, uh, to share a comment that a couple of people mentioned, and then I'll I'll pass this back to Christy. Um, we have a couple questions, and of course the regional stories that we weren't able to get to, and so um, we'll hopefully be compiling those in a way that we can um, share them with Kate, and maybe some additional answers can be shared back with participants and in, in follow up uh, in the follow up that we'll send out to you. So the last comment was from um, Lindsay Smith, among other people, who asked about the articles that you referenced, Kate. Um, and so there was a lot of interest in those articles from the Journal of Environmental Studies and Sciences. Um, so wondering if there was a way for, for people to access them if they're not associated with an institution. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely be sharing the, the titles of those articles, which was also a question from somebody. Um, but maybe, Kate, you can comment on this, or maybe we can discuss afterwards to see if there's a way to sh actually share those articles with webinar participants. Right, and I think what I, I can, I can, uh, I can go directly to the authors and ask them about that. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so I will pass this back to Christy to wrap up, and thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your regional stories and questions. Yes, I, uh, I agree. Thank you very much. Great questions, Kate. Fantastic presentation. As I mentioned in the beginning, we, um, we, have, we use this Coffee Talk platform as a way to share information about a certain topic, but then we also like to provide ways for you to, to continue to engage if you are interested. We invite you to go to the um, website for Kate project that she mentioned, the ESNI project, Enhancing Food Security in the Northeast. 
Also, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is the first in a series that's going to be touching on developing a vision for the Chesapeake region, uh, for the food system in the Chesapeake region. And I invite you to come to our next webinar on March 9th, where Arabella Advisors will provide an overview of an assessment of the food system efforts that they have completed in the Chesapeake Food Shed. Um, again, if you are interested in participating in the development of a regional vision for the Chesapeake area, please uh, go to our website, chesapeakefoodshed.net, and click on Get Involved. Um, one correction is that the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition description of that project, um, I did not actually share that, but I think Evelyn Hartman may have um, shared that regional effort, and they are doing so much great work there around policy and, and having different work groups, and um, if you have not already, I would definitely take a look at that West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition at their website. Here are some of our upcoming coffee talks, one I just mentioned on March 9th, the other April 5th, um, that the American Heart Association will be presenting on improving the food and beverage environment, and then in May, uh, the date still to be decided, we will have one uh, coffee talk on the food recovery matching tool that the community uh, the Community Food Rescue has developed. If you are interested in leading a coffee talk, please contact us. We uh, are putting this platform out there for anyone doing food system work to use. And um, thank you all very much for your time today. We will be following up with uh, 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 the slide deck, the registration link, as well as ways to access those articles in a follow-up email. Uh, have a wonderful day.